Let's, uh, let's pray as we turn to God's word, to 1 Samuel 16. Thank you, Lord, for this great story of um, David becoming king of your people, who in so many profound ways points us to the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we ask that you speak to us, show us the mercy that is found in great David's greater son. For we ask this in his name. Amen. So in 1 Samuel chapter 16, a revolution is going on. And Bethlehem is where it's all happening. King Saul has proved to be corrupt and disobedient. And he's been rejected by the Lord. Samuel, the kingmaker, is brought out of retirement to launch the takeover. And the Bethlehem Revolution starts in 1 Samuel 16. It'll take years to complete until David is actually on the throne. And the effects will then ripple down through history to us today. Because the Bethlehem Revolution is how we find freedom and how we find hope for the future. Last week we saw how in... um, uh, in Samuel's retirement speech in chapter 12 and Samuel was kind of ending his, his job as, as the, the prophet, the judge of Israel and Saul was now on the throne a tall, handsome king who looked the part and had a great start in chapter 11 he faced an evil king a king called Serpent and he won but then he failed In between last week and today's reading, Saul has failed big time, three times. And uh, let's just read, let me just go over those three failures of Saul because they are three failures that are have a particular shape to them. I won't go into all the details, but they are uh, they are sins that we fall into. That's important. So what does Saul do that was so wrong? First of all, he, he grabbed for success by following human wisdom rather than trusting God his father. So faced with a large army, Saul had been told by God, wait, wait till the right time. After all, I am God Victory is what I give you, not what you grasp for by your own methods. But time goes on. The army starts running away. The, the good army uh, starts filtering away because they're terrified. And Saul can't trust God anymore. His patience runs out and he disobeys God. He must have been thinking, well, if the outcome is what God wants, then a, a few shortcuts doesn't matter. I'll take things into my own hands rather than trust the Lord. Secondly, his second sin, Saul used words to make himself look good, but it brought harm to others. The battle was raging. Saul wanted to appear strong and tough, a man's man. And he tells the men in the army, cursed be anyone who eats food before I've avenged myself on my enemies. It's the sort of thing you say to make yourself look strong and tough. And as a result, his men are exhausted, fighting all day with no food. They're running on empty. Saul's words to puff himself up brought harm to others. And then his third failure, he thought the best way to engage with the wider world is to compromise rather than obey the Holy Spirit. God told him by the Spirit what to do to the Amalekites, the evil enemy, and Saul thought, no, I'd rather compromise. I'm not going to obey you, God. I think I've got a better way of interacting with the wider world. And see, when Saul was chosen king, he looked the part He was literally head and shoulders above everyone else, but his heart had gone astray. Judging by appearances, great king. But the Lord looks at the heart. 
And he'd failed. Failed to trust God. He'd hurt people with his words. He'd compromised. So Saul is being replaced. And Bethlehem is where God makes the new start. A new king and a new kingdom will come to birth in this town. So Samuel travels to Bethlehem. It's dangerous. If Saul hears about it, watch out. The elders of the town are trembling with fear. The Lord says, well, tell everybody you're doing a sacrifice. That's why you're there. Bring Jesse in. And one of Jesse's sons is going to be the next king. So everyone is gathered. Samuel sees Eliab, Jesse's oldest son. And in verse 6, we read, uh, uh, Samuel thinks to himself, surely, he looks at Eliab, probably you know, impressive build, big biceps, you know, pretty handy with the sword or whatever it is, and he thinks, surely, surely, this is the Lord's anointed. This is the Lord's Messiah. And God says, no. Do not consider his appearance or his height. Sorry, wrong verse. I'm reading the wrong verse there. Um, where's it gone? Notice um, the right verse. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. We look at people, we make assessments of their suitability or, their, or how impressive they're going to be. And, and God says, people look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. See, this, this Bethlehem revolution going on here is not going to be one that plays by the rules of the world. God's king and God's kingdom, they're not governed by what we think is strong or weak, what we think is impressive or, or pathetic. Remember Acts chapter 4? Uh, the Jerusalem leaders look at the apostles Peter and John and they say, these guys are uneducated, ordinary men. What's impressive about them? But they've been with Jesus. God looks at the heart. <clears throat> he looks at the heart of the issue. He looks at the heart of the people. So Eliab is out. Along comes Abinadab, then Shammah, then four more. Seven sons pass before Samuel. And the Lord chooses none of them. And Samuel thinks, well, is there anybody else? Oh yeah, there's David out in the fields. We didn't bring him in. He's clearly not the right candidate to be, to be the next king. But God says, bring him in. So in he comes. Now there's an interesting, interesting verse here. Um, uh, David is brought in and we're told he's glowing with health and a fine appearance and handsome features. I've always thought it's slightly funny, isn't it, how God says, man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. Here's David, pretty handsome, eh? And I've, I, I've been pondering this one all week. At the very least, it's saying, when God judge, doesn't judge by human appearance, that's not the same as saying ugly is best. So it might be at least that. He says David is glowing with health. Uh, literally, he's ruddy. Some older translations say he's ruddy. It's the same word used for Esau, who had lots of red hair. Can you see where I'm going with this? Uh, so, so actually, a lot of people, Christians and, and Jewish commentators, have reckoned David was a redhead. A redhead who, presumably by, by being a redhead, was fine appearance and handsome features. <laughs> who am I to disagree? What, quite what's going on in that verse. I think there's, I think there's, a, there's a Bible theme running there, which is, to go into that would be kind of a, a distraction. The, the point is that you know, outward appearance is not the determining factor. It is not uh, the key issue here. It's not what we think, what we see with our eyes. It's what God says about somebody that really matters. The Bethlehem revolution, the new king, is God making a new start. God's not going to patch up Saul's kingdom. 
He's going to bring about a new kingdom, a new beginning. Of course, this points us to the Lord Jesus, doesn't it? The king born in the same town. Human leaders are for even the best ones are corrupt. Whether it's corrupt in a kind of deliberately out to get for themselves way or just corrupt because where they're human. Human leaders are corrupted. Governments go wrong. Presidents, prime ministers, kings and emperors, they all fail. They're all flawed. And one of the glories of the good news of Jesus is this, that we have a perfect king. The hand, that the, the the, the ruler of the universe, the hands that uphold all of creation, the, the hands who hold the power to determine history, they're not the hands of a corrupt president or prime minister or an imperfect parliament. The child born in Bethlehem is the greatest leader, the true king of all. The emperor of the universe is perfectly good Perfectly true, wonderfully faithful, utterly trustworthy. Christ Jesus, born in Bethlehem, is not just yet another king. He's a league above the others because he is the perfect king. Earthly rulers, don't they? They they start a big project. They say it's about the good of the country. But a bit of fame doesn't help. Doesn't, you know, nothing wrong with a bit of fame along the way. Governments have big initiatives. Before long, the spending is overrun. It's 10 years behind schedule. And it doesn't work the way it should have been. Imagine if the universe was run that way. How glorious that the one who runs the universe, the destiny of all creation, is in the hands of the perfect king, the good and loving Messiah, our Christ, the Lord Jesus. That is a revolution worth celebrating but the the Bethlehem revolution goes even deeper than that it is not just that we need a new king on the throne though that is true no God's going to get to it even deeper what this story points us to is an even deeper revolution And that's symbolised by the fact that David is the eighth son. Number eight. Number eight is a very important number in the Bible. Let me just give a little bit of context. The the meaning of the number eight. Numbers, a lot of numbers in the Bible have have a significance to them. Seven. What does seven make you think of? Creation. So uh, creation is linked with seven days. Science, debate, all that debate, that's another time. Creation is a seven day event linked to number seven. So, eight is the start of a new week. It's a new start. It could even be the beginning of a new creation. Think of the story of Noah's Ark. The world is corrupt, and God is going to wash it clean and make a new start. How many people were on the ark? Eight. Noah, Mrs. Noah, three sons and three daughters-in-law. Eight. And Peter picks it up in his letter. Eight people pass through the waters of cleansing and judgment. And eight start the new world. The new creation. When were Israelite boys circumcised? How old were they? Eight days. It's a new start. Symbolically, it's a cutting off of the past. Sorry, it makes you wince. And, uh, and, and it's a new beginning on the eighth, the eighth day. Jesus was raised from the dead. So on the first day of the week, an eighth day. The third day after the crucifixion. Uh, crucifixion day one, day two, day three. It's the third day. But it's also the eighth day. The first day of a new week. The new creation started when Jesus entered, exited the tomb on the eighth day. Some churches have fonts with eight sides because it picks up the symbolism of of a new start, a new creation 
The old is gone, the new has come. And, in, and David is an eighth son. To make the point that we don't just need a new king, we need a new creation. We need, a, we need a, a, something new that is deeper than structures in the world. Human nature itself needs to be changed. Why is Saul flawed? Because we're all flawed. Our very nature is corrupted. Now David will become the great king and David is, is miles better than, than Saul. And for chapter after chapter, it's, it's, it's great. Here is a humble, patient, servant-hearted, tender new king. And he comes to the throne and brings peace. And then, when it's all looking so good, David falls. David's nature is corrupt. What we need is not just a better sort of person. We need a perfect sort of person because our nature is corrupt. And so God looks down on the world and says, humanity has gone wrong. It is fundamentally in its very nature failing and corrupt. So in Bethlehem, I'm raising up a new humanity in my son, Jesus Christ. You ever seen somebody doing a job so badly that you kind of elbow them out of the way and step in and do it for them? God looked down on the world and saw humanity doing such a hopeless job of being human. Nobody living a life of faith with pure words and uncompromised life. So God steps in to do humanity properly. Jesus is born in Bethlehem, the town of David, to, as it were, restart and reboot what it means to be human. Now, why does that matter? This is why this is such good news for us. Why do revolutions take place? They happen because people want a better world. Governments are toppled when the people hope for real change and they think their government will not deliver. And a revolution is the, 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 the desire, the hope for a better life, a better country. And 20 years later, it's not the same, is it? All that ambition, all the desire, all the, the hopes for a better society. 20 months later, it's probably gone wrong. Communism was a revolution to change the world, to bring in harmony. But it failed because communism never took into account human nature. Military coups take place. The president is ejected, well, either strung up or sent off to, a, a, to enjoy a Swiss bank account somewhere for the rest of his life. And the new anti-corruption rulers take over. Before long, they've got Swiss bank accounts. No human revolution will ever work because it can never go deep enough. All human revolutions promise a better world, but they fail because no human can bring about a better world. Because we are all fundamentally, deeply, at our very nature, failures, corrupt going wrong. Yes, we do wonderful things. We're not, we're not like everything we do is as bad as it could be, but nothing we do is pure. Humanity cannot deliver the perfect world. We try, we fail, but Jesus was born in Bethlehem so that a, a deeper revolution could take place where the one who is both son of David and son of Mary would come and live the human life that we cannot live. He lives the perfect life that completely eludes us so that his perfect life might bring about the true perfect future. Imagine a door. A door is shut in front of you. And beyond the door is perfection. 
glory, joy. There is God behind the door. The fountain of life and joy and peace. And we approach the door and there is no way in because we are corrupt. We would just spoil it if we went in. Even if we were allowed in. Our corrupted nature cannot open up the door. But Jesus was born into Bethlehem to be the start of a new humanity, to live the incorruptible and incorrupted life. So that when Jesus approaches the door, as it were, having lived a life of full obedience, the door is opened up. And then Jesus stands at the door and then reaches out hand to us. He's opened the door. Now he, he brings us in as well. And when, when, he, and when he grabs hold of us, it's as if our, our corruption has passed to him and his perfection has passed to us. In, a, in 1 Samuel 16, we told, uh, Samuel's told, take a heifer, uh, have a sacrifice. So the people are there for the sacrifice, the animal is there for the sacrifice. The people have been invited to a sacrifice. But once David is anointed, the sacrifice doesn't take place. The narrative reads like it's all heading towards a sacrifice, but then it doesn't happen. And we're left wondering, the narrative makes us wonder, well, when's the sacrifice going to take place then? Because Jesus, the true son of David, would die as the sacrifice. On the cross, he takes human nature with all its failures, all our corruption and sin. He takes it on himself and he dies the death that we deserve. And then he rises from the dead on that eighth day, the first day of a new week. Because the door has been opened. His perfect life covers over our failed life. His death pays for our sin. And clothed in Jesus, having received, been covered over by his perfection, we too can enter the door into the true kingdom. If the perfect world depends on us, or a new ism, communism, capitalism, humanism, whatever ism you can think of, it's never going to work. But Jesus comes into Bethlehem to live the perfect life, to open up that door, to bring the fundamental revolution that offers a real future. And he brings us in by himself. So let me end by going back over those three failures of Saul. And perhaps you see yourself in those failures. But what we'll see is that Jesus has covered it over by his death, by his life, by his death, and then in his resurrection, opened the door. What does Saul do again? He was impatient and he led him to disobedience. What do we do when we're impatient? Do we trust our Heavenly Father naturally? Is that what we do naturally? No, it's not. Human nature. If we're faced with waiting, we grumble, we're anxious, we moan, we're fed up, we're angry, that things aren't going the way we want. That's human nature. It's corrupt. But Jesus lived the life of perfect faith and perfect patience. He wasn't swayed by the, whether people were with him or against him. Jesus trusted his heavenly father, even going to death on the cross, waiting for God to give him success. And so Jesus' perfect patience and trust covers over our impatient grasping. His righteousness covers our faith, faithlessness. And so we're welcomed into the new creation. Saul used words to make himself look impressive, but it harmed his brothers. And don't we do the same? 
We use words to make ourselves look good. And wittingly or unwittingly, we harm others. Maybe, maybe you use words of gossip and slander to do someone down to make yourself look like you've got the news. You're better than them. Maybe you're the sort of person, there's a conversation going on and you, you, you're desperate to get yourself in there to show that, yes, I too am interesting. I too have a story to tell. We cut people off. How often we might use humour to make ourselves look good and harm those who are the butt of the joke. That's human nature. It's corrupt. But Jesus used words to heal. He used words to welcome in and to include and to lift up the broken. And Jesus' life of perfect words covers over our life of harmful words. His righteousness covers our lies and gossip and pride. And so Jesus welcomes us to the new creation. And Saul thought the best way to engage with the world, compromise rather than obedience. And how often we compromise to make ourselves fit in with others. We make up lies to look good. Yes, it's really in the post, we say. Yes, I've, I, I remember that thing. And we, we tell lies to make ourselves look good. We compromise on Jesus' teaching because we think we'll win people that way. That's human nature. It's corrupt. But Jesus, full of the Spirit, never compromised. He even didn't compromise and ended up dying for that. And so his perfection covers our compromises. His righteousness covers over our pretending, our disobedience. And so we are welcomed into the new creation. Do you live? We, we, we all do. We live with pretense, twisted words, compromise, lack of patience, lack of trust. We live with all these things and if the glorious future was due to us, there would be no glorious future. But the Bethlehem revolution is that God sent Jesus to be the perfect man, to live the perfect life, to die for our sin, to rise again on an eighth day, to open the door into glory. That is the revolution that Jesus has brought about. So that we, with all our failure, all our compromise, all our history of failure and weakness, might have the future that he has brought about. No earthly revolution will ever change society fundamentally. No new start, New Year's resolution, new ambition, new diet, new plan, new to-do list will ever really sort out life. But Jesus has come to live the perfect life and give that life to us forever. Let's pray. Maybe you have a sense of shame or failure from the past that still haunts you, still feels like it's holding you back. Know this, Jesus lived to give you a perfect future. I pray, Heavenly Father, that this truth, that Jesus lived the perfect life to do humanity properly, would give us such freedom such confidence before you because our future does not depend on us. It's been opened up by the Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, that this would be a freedom that brings about many revolutions in our hearts day by day. Thank you for the Lord Jesus, for his faithful life, his death for us, his resurrection. May we walk in the freedom of the real Bethlehem revolution. In Jesus' name.
Amen.